My name is Nicole Kurlander. I'm a faculty member here in the School of Education and also chair of the Graduate Group in Education, which is a collection of faculty across the UC Davis campus who are investigating issues related to education, uh, both in the School of Education and across campus and other departments. Um, and we uh, are today fortunate enough to be talking about one of the most critical issues facing the state of California and the nation more generally, and we have a distinguished speaker. And so I'm going to turn it over to Megan Walsh, who will be uh, my colleague at the School of Education, who will be introducing our speaker. Please. So, thank you. Hi. I'm very honored today to be able to introduce Dr. Edward Hartle, who's going to give our distinguished speaker lecture today. Dr. Hartle is a, a, a very uh, highly acclaimed scholar of psychometrics and has held many, many interesting and important positions and received many, many honors. He is, he is emeritus now the Jack's Family Professor of Education at Stanford. He is a, an associate dean of faculty affairs at Stanford as well. He has been, he's been made a fellow of many, many places and the American What's interesting, right, is in the American Psychological Association, normally you have, if you're, if you're um, you know, prestigious enough to get a fellowship in one, one division of APA, that's a really, really good thing. But he actually has received, been awarded um, as a fellow of, of multiple divisions of APA. <laughs> and also at the American Educational Research Association. And he's also been a, a member and a vice president of programs for the National Academy of Education and the president of the National <coughs> Council of American Young Women and Education. In addition to all of those things, he's won, won just multiple, multiple awards. And if you ever go to um, ARA, the American Educational Research Association Conference, the best awards are given at this, this luncheon that every other thing on the program is, there's nothing else, that everyone will go and watch the people come up onto the dais and receive the awards. And Dr. Hartle has won multiple different ones of those awards. <laughs> Uh, the Palmer O. Johnson Award, which is uh, an award for best paper. The E.M. Lindquist Award, which is an award for um, a career award for measurement scholars. And then also, um, and within Division D of ARA, which is the psychometric division of ARA, he won a career award that El the Robert Harrison <coughs> Dis Distinguished Address. And in particular, his presentation at that address is what um, motivated me to want him to come here very, very much. because. In that address, he talked a great deal about the, the role of psychometricians and of psychometrics in influencing and informing policy and the way that we do education. And, and I thought that that was um, something that we don't sort of think about enough in the field of psychometrics. And as policymakers, we don't necessarily think about psychometrics enough either. So that's a major contribution. He has also won career awards from the National Council of Measurement and Education and from the California Education. Um, there are frankly many more awards on his CV, but there's only so many that were fit on his CV. He's also played a big role in the technical advisory committees to many, many assessment systems, both within the state of California and nationally, and again, those are, are too many to, to list. As I, as I foreshadowed, there's, there's several areas in which he has contributed. The first, of course, is, is psychometrics. And one of the things that you learn early on as a psychometric scholar is that it's really easy and really elegant and really fun to play with numbers. And you can spend and devote an entire career to sitting in front of your computer and you, looking at either extent data sets from, from school, just from state departments of education, but even more commonly, to, to generate your own data sets with your computer and just analyze those. You don't need to go through IRB, you don't need, there's all kinds of very um, elegant and easy things you can do if you decide to take that, that track. Not to um, mean that that's an easy road to, to hack, but, but it, is, it is certainly possible. And actually prevalent. There's also sort of influencing teaching, and there are many people who are scholars within the field of teaching and focus just on that area. And of course also policy, who focus just on policy. And, what's, and I'm going to talk about Dr. Hoddle's contributions in each of those areas, but what's really, I think, notable is how he has sort of brought all three of those fields together and informed, enriched all of them. So in terms of psychometrics, um, relatively early in, in Dr. Hoddle's career, he spent a fair amount of time in working with latent 
class models, and in particular, predicting student membership in discrete groups. So thinking about students who are proficient or not proficient on uh, some sort of unobserved category of characteristic using whatever sort of indicators we've collected. He's also thought about how to use latent class models to uncover clusters of subskills that that tests actually get at. Now, he did this a while ago, way before it was really the new and sexy thing in measurement. To, and it became sort of the foundational work for, for current work in things like diagnostic classification models, where we break apart tests and think about specific sort of subset of skills that are required to do well in a test, but also thinking about what sort of information we can get from tests about different, different, more, um, different subsets of skills that tests might get at. Sometimes intentionally measured, sometimes unintentionally measured. He's also involved in standard setting, which is the method that we use to, to identify whether or not a student is proficient or, ex or exceeds standards or, meet, or meets or is below standards. Um, on generalizability theory, which is an entire area of measurement that that I hold near and dear and that you will learn about in my class when you take it next spring, this spring. And also equating, which has to do with thinking about um, how to create a, a common score across multiple forms of a test or multiple, multiple tests. Within teaching, the influence has been mostly related to, to assessment in some way. Uh, way back when I was teaching, performance assessments were very big uh, at the more of a high stakes level as an attempt to get teachers to teach in ways that were more rich and not just teach to the test. And he was very involved in, in some work around that. As well as around criterion reference testing, which has to do with determining, um, thinking about students' performance relative to a set of expectations instead of relative to other students. And also involved in teacher certification, not teacher evaluation at this point, but literally teacher certification, the, the test that we use to certify whether or someone should to go into the classroom. And finally, in policy, a lot of his work more recently is, is, is very much devoted to this, thinking about um, the use of value-added models to evaluate teachers, and, um, and other ways of, value, of evaluating teachers, and also thinking about how we have to do test validation differently when we're trying to make inferences about, about schools in addition. So finally, what I just want to say is that um, Dr. Harville is someone who I hold up as sort of a model of who I would like to be as an engaged psychometric scholar because the work is not just about, it's very, very sophisticated and interesting work about making the scores better, but beyond that, about making the field of education better. And that is why I'm so pleased to have him here today, Dr. Harville. Thank you, Megan, for the very kind inter and lavish introduction. I, I, uh, I, I scarcely need to say anything. I should just uh, take a bow, and that that that'll be just fine. Um, there's a oh, there's a barrier there. I see. That's actually reassuring. I can't. So, um, one second. So. Uh, it really is an honor to be here and a real pleasure. I've had a marvelous time in many, many stimulating conversations since this morning. It's been a very rich day, and I really appreciate the chance to join you, and I appreciate your attendance here. Um, I've been involved with accountability and assessment for a long time, in California in particular. Uh, Megan didn't mention my work in Sacramento with the Technical Advisory Committee. Eric Crane sits on that, that committee with me now, and uh, it's been great connecting with you again since your days back when you were at the department and, and sometimes in, in between. Um, I hope today to say a little about the nuts and bolts of new tests and new laws, uh, a little bit of history going back to how we got to where we are now. Much of what I have to say is going to be simply background for questions and conversation afterwards. So um, I've been asked to leave plenty of time for questions, probably best to hold questions till the end unless what I say is just utterly incomprehensible. Um, uh, the slides are numbered. There's a little number down in the lower right-hand corner there. There are 54 of them. So those of you who are sort of counting down to the end of this will know <laughs> how much time remains. 
I know that you're all accustomed to learning from these kinds of presentations and, and good, good listeners, so if any of you should finish listening before I finish talking, I'd ask that you just please sit quietly and wait for me to catch up. Uh, uh, this first slide has a takeaway message, which is that we are in education in an ARE. ARE stands for Acronym Rich Environment. <laughs> I'll unpack some of these abbreviations as we go along. These are some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. At the federal level, No Child Left Behind has been replaced by the uh, Every Student Succeeds Act. Uh, California Standards Tests have been re replaced by the New Test from the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, uh, authorized under the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, which replaces the old standardized testing and reporting system. Um, this gets tiresome, doesn't it? Uh, CELT has been replaced by LPAC. Uh, the California content frameworks are replaced by the Common Core State Standards, the Next Generation Science Standards, and of course we have the local control funding formula and our local control accountability plans. So there's lots of new stuff. It's not exactly a moment, but it's a short period of time within which there's a great deal of change that's happened. And um, equally important, uh, we really have alignment among the key actors. We don't have the kind of fighting and that can lead to paralysis in the policy sphere with the governor, the state superintendent of public instruction, the, the president of the State Board of Education, all on the same page. California Teachers Association, largely supportive of the Common Core and of the new assessments, although, of course, they have legitimate concerns about uh, the availability of new curriculum materials and the degree of in-service and pre-service teacher preparation to deal with the new standards. Basically, people are all pulling in the same direction, and that, that's huge. Um, the California public is generally supportive. There's been minimal pushback on Common Core in this state compared to some other places. Minimal opt-out from the Smarter Balance testing, generally good approval. Um, implementation timelines right now are ambitious, but I'm saying not insane. Some of my colleagues would, would disagree, but we have a hiatus from accountability testing during this transition to the new assessments, and that's huge. It gives us a little bit of breathing space to figure out where we're going and get things running so we don't quite have to build the, uh, lay the tracks in front of the locomotive while it's, while it's moving along. It's close to that. We're not quite building the plane while flying it, but um, we're, uh, so, so thing, things could be a lot better. It could be a lot worse. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion that things are going to go this well. If we compare the situation in California, say, to New York, another large liberal state, which has now opted out of the park consortium, there we had huge pushback, uh, massive opt-outs, a lot of resistance uh, to the Common Core and so on. Part of the reason, I believe, was that the governor in New York pushed hard to use these new assessments uh, for teacher accountability using value-added models, where we use student test scores as a way of judging which educators are doing better or worse than expectations. And that has led to a lot of resistance and some embarrassment when the teacher of the year turns out to be not effective and, and things like that, which seem to pop up with distressing regularity. Um, it's also not a foregone conclusion even looking just at California's history. If we look way back in time, uh, you may, some of you may remember something called the California Learning Assessment System, or CLASS. Uh, CLASS was developed beginning, beginning in 1991, about 25 years ago. It became operational in 1993, and it abruptly stopped after 1994. Not quite 20 years ago, in December of 1996, a Stanford professor named Professor Michael Kirst uh, and one of his students, Chris Mazio, published an analysis of what happened with CLASS in Philo to Capen. Uh, who would have thought back then, 20 years ago, that 20 years hence, that, uh, that Mike Hurst would be back at the helm of the State Board of Education and overseeing the implementation of a new testing and assessment system, which is in some ways vastly more ambitious than the California Learning Assessment System ever was. So uh, there were some lessons learned back then, and uh, the rollout this time has been handled more wisely, but there's also a certain degree of luck. Uh, as I said, the stars have aligned. This is an opportunity when it really does feel like something different could happen. I've been in this business a long time and could recite many more acronyms than showed up in that first slide, if I could just remember them. But uh, the point is that this is a time when something new really may be happening for, for the good, and uh, 
we need to seize the moment and make the best of it. So just how is testing supposed to improve schooling outcomes? Testing alone is not an, an instructional intervention. Uh, uh, Representative Bobby Scott, Democrat from Virginia, the ranking measure of the House Education and Workforce Committee, has uh, appropriated the saying, you can't fatten a pig by weighing it, to refer to what happens when you try to use assessment as a tool for education reform. But testing alone is not the intervention. Uh, no matter how many times you put that pig on the scale, it doesn't make it fatter. No matter how many times you test the kids, that doesn't in itself improve their, their achievement or their mastery of what we want them to learn. So, measurement in driven instruction can be expected to, well, how is testing supposed to improve schooling? There's a lot of storylines and values come into play. Even when there's agreement about something that testing is causing to happen, some people may think it's good, some people may think it's bad. I put a new high stakes math test into place and the result is that teachers spend more time having children learn how to solve algebra problems and less time discussing their mathematical ideas. Some people think that's a good thing, some people think it's a bad thing. So testing may be intended to focus instruction on valued learning outcomes, or it may be narrowing instruction only to the content on the test. We need to rein teachers in because they're wandering all over the place and being creative. We just need to get them on task, or do we need to make room for education to unfold in a different way? These are complicated questions, and you don't have to, it's not a multiple choice question. You don't have to choose one or the other. Um, is this going to improve student motivation by setting clear expectations? Do we need to give students feedback? You are not proficient, you need to work harder. Or is it going to undermine motivation by making high scores the goal of, of instruction? Uh, do we reduce inequities by targeting resources more effectively? Or do we limit resources by substituting symbolic action, you know, a highly publicized new testing program, in place of actually doing something substantive like making sure kids have a good breakfast before they start the school day? Um, are we encouraging the use of proven instructional strategies, perhaps getting teachers back to basics? Or are we directing, driving instruction toward worksheets and scripted curricula and discouraging exploration? You know, it's, uh, the answers are not simple. There was a time in my own career when I was pretty squarely in uh, the uh, right-hand column here. Uh, there's actually a paper by a scholar named Richard, Richard Phelps of why do testing experts hate tests? Uh, and, but I've sort of moved around to where I see some value in both columns here, and I see some. The trick is to sort of thread, thread the needle and find a way to make these rules work in ways that, uh, that, that give us the best possible outcomes. Um, we also need to ask the question of whether we're holding schools accountable for things that are really beyond their control. Um, Back in 2002, at the dawn of No Child Left Behind, uh, Harvard professor Richard Elmore argued that the law's almost exclusive focus on testing and accountability rather than capacity building was misplaced. Uh, and empirical studies of NCLB's effects 15 years later have largely borne out as pessimistic predictions. Uh, that's why it's important to attend to the whole system, not just the test scores. Uh, he wrote then that Low-performing schools and the people in the, who work in them don't know what to do. If they did, they'd be doing it. Simply uh, giving a test per se without investing in uh, teacher knowledge, pedagogical skills, understanding of students is not going to uh, improve, improve performance. So with that, with those few words, let me turn then to some of the events that are shaping the development of California's next school ability system, beginning with the new federal legislation. Uh, no Child Left Behind was a reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Before No Child Left Behind, the previous reauthorization was the Improving America Schools Act, signed by President Bill Clinton in 1994. And subsequent to No Child Left Behind, the next reauthorization, of course, was ESSA, which was just signed in December of this past year. Um, when NCLB was enacted seven years after the previous ESSA reauthorization, it was expected that it would be replaced in its turn in another seven years or so. But of course, instead, it's stayed the law of the land for 15 years, all the way up and through 2015. Um, 
Let's looking back for a moment, uh, NCLB served as a really lovely, horrible example for me to use in a chapter that I co-authored recently with a former student of mine, our Harvard professor, Andrew Ho, concerning the validation of derived scores. We looked at um, NCLB and thought of No Child Left Behind's final binary and two value school level determination of which schools are making satisfactory progress versus which ones are in need of improvement. That's like a score. We have two classifications, two labels. We decide for a given school whether it's in this category or that category. <clears throat> and if we think about that as a very complicated kind of test score and look at how we get there, then we can ask from a psychometric perspective, how would I go about thinking about the reliability and the validity of this score for intended uses interpretation and interpretations? How do, we, how do I even frame what the construct is that this score is supposed to be measuring. And that's a, that's a kind of a shift in perspective. We don't usually think about it that way. But this slide shows us how we actually get to this final binary determination. We begin with student test scores, fine. We compare those scores to a threshold or a cut point that says if you're above this, this particular cut point, you're proficient, otherwise you're not proficient. So the first step is a student level binary determination, proficient, not proficient. And those are aggregated up to the group level to say what percent of the students in a given group are proficient. Uh, then that percent proficient for the group is compared to another threshold called the annual measurable objective, or AMO. This is not I love in Latin, it's something else. Um, the annual measurable objectives become very important on my next slide here. All this is done for multiple groups, but only if they're numerically significant. So we have different groups in different schools, depending. Then we apply a conjunctive to school level decision rule and we say whether all the groups that are numerically significant have met the AMO threshold for a given year. Uh, and we also factor in these participation rate criteria that at least 95% in each of those groups took the test. But we are allowed to exclude one or 2%, actually it's 1% and 2% under different sets of rules for, of students with severe disabilities, accepting the safe harbor provision that we can apply to Get, pa get a pass even if some groups didn't really meet the standard, provided they made sufficient progress over the preceding year. And uh, as not envisioned in the original law, we adjust the safe harbor uh, determination using a margin of error adjustment, which was never envisioned in the original legislation. But this is a mess. It, it's different in every state. When we're finished, it's very difficult to say what the construct actually was. Um, let me. In particular, let me turn to this annual measurable objective and say a little more about that because that's part of the next piece of my story. The AMOs, um, are, spe are specify these percent proficient thresholds that the groups within a school have to meet year by year. Uh, the 2002 objectives were specified according to rules set forth in the original legislation and that states were free to lay out their AMOs for subsequent years with two conditions. The AMO could only remain constant for three years at a time before it went up, and it had to reach 100% proficiency by 2014. That was President George W. Bush's uh, mantra, 100% you know, proficient by 2014. So nobody really thought this was realistic, but nobody thought that NCLB was going to be around for 15 years. So California, like most states, adopted what we referred to as the balloon mortgage scenario. You know, remember the old balloon mortgages where you have a, a very slow escalation and low payments and then everything comes due at the end and the assumption is at that point you're going to refinance and maybe in a more favorable economic climate. Well here, the balloon mortgage is three years at this initial uh, AMO, then a little bump up, three more years here, and then the balloon mortgage comes up as we shoot up toward 100% by 2014. So the consequence of this was that by 2014, instead of approaching 100% of students proficient, we were approaching 100% of schools in need of improvement. So as NCLB lingered, reauthorization didn't happen year after year. Consequences for the states grew increasingly dire. U.S. Secretary of Education leveraged his waiver authority uh, to push the administration's policy agenda. He required states to take certain actions in order to be eligible for waivers from the law's requirements. He also put pressure on states similarly by 
requiring them to take certain actions, even to be eligible to apply for race to the top, race to the top funding. This was a very shrewd way of leveraging a small amount of money to, to great effect, because even if only a few states ended up getting the grants, all of them had to meet these requirements uh, in order to submit applications and try for the money. It's like when you increase your survey participation by saying there's going to be a lottery and somebody's going to get a $10 Amazon gift card. So it might be you. Um, so possible takeaways from all this are <clears throat> the Secretary either was doing what he had to, had to be done to help chil the children of America in the face of congressional paralysis, or he was giving Congress the runaround. It's, uh, so we'll come back to that a bit later. Oops. <coughs> I don't know if that's something I'm doing. I'm hearing a hum. OK. Um, after repeated false starts and seemingly against all odds, in the midst of a ramp up to the next election cycle, the reauthorization actually happened. The drafting of Senate Bill 1177 began in early 2015. It was in conference by last November. And in a rare bipartisan moment, it passed in the House, 359 to 64, and the Senate, 85 to 12, with broad bipartisan support was signed into law by President Barack Obama on December 10th. So um, one implication of this in California, incidentally, is that the alternative accountability system that the core districts were developing under their waiver is going to be sunset because they will need to be folded into the statewide accountability system now that that waiver, no, it's a waiver from a law that's no longer in effect. So. Uh, in a year or two, we'll be back to a single unified system. I think that the state can learn a lot of good lessons from the great work that the core districts have done. That, that's encouraging. So, so what are the ESSA requirements? In, in broad outline, it's a lot like NCLB, but states have much, much greater flexibility than they had before. I've listed a few highlights here. There's other important changes as well, including getting rid of a lot of small grants programs, creating some new Title I funding set-asides. <clears throat> There's a new competitive grants program for preschool education, among other provisions. I'm, I'm focusing here on the law's requirements for accountability and testing in particular, because that's our topic for today. And fortunately, given that, it's also the one thing I know a little bit about. Um, so what's still, still the same? We're still going to have testing uh, for grades 3 through 8 plus from the high school grade, reading and, and English, language, arts, and math. Science at one, one test in each of three grade spans. Science tests are still not necessarily included in the accountability formula. Still have the 95% participation criterion here. We still need ambitious goals, a plan for closing gaps. Um, but we have nothing like that very complicated Rube Goldberg uh, series of calculations that were all spelled out under NCLB. That's gone. States have a lot of flexibility. Um, so we do have to have, under ESSA, five um, indicators. Those are laid out at this level of specificity, but there's really not much more than this said about them in the law. Achievement is still primary. We need to use those reading and math tests. Uh, and that indicator must receive the most weight. Then a second is student growth, although there's an option to do something else. We probably will do growth. I think most places will. What that means is linking up individual students' test scores this year and last year and seeing how much individual students have actually grown. So it's still you slicing and dicing the test scores, but it's doing something very different with them. Uh, and that's for elementary schools. It doesn't really make sense to talk about trying to do that at high school because First of all, we don't test kids every year in high school. And you need the annual testing to make these growth models work. You just, otherwise, you just don't have the data. And also, children's proficiency in the, these core literacy and numeracy areas is not changing very fast by the time they get to high school. It's very difficult to measure the increment in high school students' reading proficiency from, say, 10th grade to 11th grade. You're just, you need very sensitive tests. It had to be very long tests and probably targeted at specific kinds of skills. And it just isn't going to work. Um, but the, it's nice to include the growth as well as achievement, because if all we're looking at is um, achievement, that really rewards the schools that have an easier time of it because they're serving more advantaged populations. The growth is something which, in some ways, gives schools that are 
doing a good job with the more challenging student populations, a chance to uh, be represented in the formula for the good work that they're doing. And conversely, of course, if kids are not making progress, even high achieving kids, we need to know that. Uh, at the high school level, high school graduation rate needs to be included. For English learners, we need progress toward English proficiency, and we need one additional indicator. The examples really move us away from the cognitive academic achievement test measures uh, on, the, on this indicator. What's suggested in the law are these things that are listed here. Student engagement, educator engagement, access to and completion of advanced coursework, and so on. You'll see some of these come up again when we look at the eight priorities under the uh, local control accountability plans. Um, there's also a comprehensive, and support, comprehensive support and improvement plan required. This has to be for the bottom 5% of schools, as well as for any high school that fails one third or more of its students. Um, this is going to be a bit of a challenge for California because uh, following the governor's lead, we're thinking in California about a system that really uses multiple indicators and resists putting them all together to get a single number. We want a small, concise set of numbers that really do represent meaningfully different dimensions of what schools are doing so we can learn more than we get with just a single numerical ranking, much as the real estate agents might, might clamor for something like the API that tells them which, which schools are the, are the best. Um, so we'll need to put these, probably some kind of weighted, weighted composite of these five indicators. How those are weighted is going to matter because different weights will reflect different policy priorities about where these resources should be allocated. Uh, we don't have detailed guidance as yet. Uh, all of this is a bit unsettling to some administrators who've been accustomed for a long time to a kind of a, a compliance mindset. We hear the question, just tell us what we're supposed to do. And the answer is what you're supposed to do is figure it out. These are the, this is the framework, these are the guidelines. We want to see the experimentation, we want to see different solutions in different states. So it, it's a, it really is a very interesting time you know, for education policy. And some things are happening that haven't happened for a long time. Other ESSA provisions. A few slides back, I mentioned the two possible takeaways regarding Senator, uh, Secretary Arne Duncan's creative use of his authority with the waivers, either acting out of necessity in the face of correct congressional paralysis or usurping the powers of the legislature. It seems pretty clear from the ESSA language which of these interpretations the legislators favored. All through the uh, uh, new act, there are various strictures that limit the authority or the power of the Secretary of Education. So it may not require that states uh, submit their academic content standards for approval. This is perhaps in response to the subtle and not so subtle ways that the department pressed the states to adopt the common core state standards. May not dictate definitions of teacher effectiveness. So all of this highly qualified teacher stuff which caused some flap a ways back is, is history uh, and so forth. Another important thing is the Title III provisions, uh, accountability provisions, this is for English learners, have been moved into Title I. So the accountability for English learners is, is more, better integrated with the rest of the system. <clears throat> I'm going to turn now from the federal level to the state level. This is a lot of text and a lot of detail. I'm going to get to some items at the end to show you how the smarter balanced items differ from the old California standards test items. And then we'll, we'll move to questions. So I'll try to, try to move right along. Um, very quickly, oh, I should spell out some abbreviations. I said I'd be careful with the acronyms. Average daily attendance is here, and FRPM is the free and reduced price meal program. That's the free lunch program. It's how we, basically how we measure poverty because it's available. Not, as, not that it's a terribly good measure, but it works. So the local control funding formula is a marvel of simplicity. Uh, we have a base amount for each student. The precise amount depends on the grade level, grade range of the student. And then we get a 20% supplement on top of that for those students who are disadvantaged. For disadvantaged to find in any of these ways, at most one supplement per student. Um, there's some additional uh, 
requirements. Uh, there's a few additional funding streams and supplements. There's compliance conditions. The whole thing could be laid out in 10 or 15 minutes. This is replacing a system that had grown over 40 years in California to become extremely complex with uh, over 50 separate categorical programs, block grants, revenue limits. It was just uh, our funding, educational funding was a mess. Mike Kirst had talked about this for years, and I know that he's very happy to be uh, in a position to see where we finally are moving to a much more rational system. Implementation is going well. Um, we're ahead of the schedule for the phase in. We're not quite there yet. The reason we can't just snap our fingers and do it is that we're moving from an, a very unequal system to this more regularized system in a way that sort of holds people harmless and doesn't cause abrupt disruptions. We can't just suddenly change everybody's budget drastically, so schools are moving toward this, this new, uh, more rational system. Um, LCAP priorities. There are eight of these priorities for uh, local education agencies, that's LEA, it's another acronym, and a couple more for county offices of education, or COEs. It's, it's funny how we use these yeah. acronyms and just get used to them and don't even notice after a while. But the, it's, I'm, I'm trying to, if I miss some, just let me know, hey, what's, what, what's that letter string? And I probably will know the answer. But, um, so the um, state is right now developing an e-template that LEAs will be able to use for drafting and submitting their local control, local control accountability plans. Um, here's three more of the priorities. Um, I'm not sure, but I think this eighth priority, using whatever outcomes are available in various areas, this is for grades one through six, this is for grades seven through 12. My reading is that this may require that the local accountability plans make use of those uh, science tests that are mandated under ESSA, but are not required for the school accountability under the federal legislation. We'll have to see what happens with that. Um, we also see, as I mentioned, some of the same things here, like school climate, that we saw as po potential uh, indicators for that fifth indicator under, under ESSA. A couple of additional LCAP priorities for county offices of education. Uh, and that just wraps that, that string up. <clears throat> OK. Time to turn from the legislation to the new Common Core state standards. <clears throat> California has endorsed the Common Core, replaces the old state curriculum frameworks in reading and mathematics. Uh, I'm sorry, English language arts and mathematics. Proponents of the Common Core take great pains to point out they were not a creation of the federal government. They were developed by a consortium of states under the auspices of the National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers. The Common Core is not a curriculum. Nobody is dictating curriculum to schools. That's still a matter of local control. Standards are supposed to describe intended learning outcomes, not the details of curriculum. They do include substantial high-level guidance as to what classroom instruction ought to look like. But they're really kind of a curious creation. When I was in school, I don't, I'm not sure we had anything called standards. If we did, they certainly didn't carry this kind of weight. But the creation of this thing called a stand, standards or set of standards solves this problem of how to exercise more control and bring greater unification from the federal level or the national level to a system where the traditions of local control are so strong and it's a state's rights issue that the, you, the feds are supposed to stay out of education. Here's a quick high level overview about what, what's in the standards. They're grade specific standards, K through five, and then literacy standards for 6 through 12 in ELA, or ELA slash L, English Language Arts and Literacy. In mathematics, we have separate standards for grades K through 8. There are 11 domains. We also have these practices, uh, which Alan Schoenfeld has described as the know-how that makes for successful use of the content. Um, <clears throat> While I'm on the topic of standards, we also have new standards in science. Um, standards. The next generation science standards are what they're called, but I'm backing up here to a previous document, a 2011 report from the National Research Council, which set forth a, a document titled Framework for K-12 Science Education. This described three interrelated dimensions as listed here. It covered multiple science disciplines. Uh, despite that committee's best efforts to keep things lean, uh, there's way, way too much content sort of like this PowerPoint presentation. 
Uh, professor Emerita Helen Quinn from Stanford said, there's no such thing as a professor of STEM. Uh, we have, we're trying to amalgamate lots and lots of different areas. Science is a vast, complicated uh, bin with lots and lots of, of distinct disciplines inside of it. And to try to pull all this together into a single standards document is just, it, it may not be sensible, but politically it, it had to be done, and that's what we have. It became clear very early on that the uh, science framework was not a standards document, that it was not uh, going to be sufficient to guide curriculum and instruction. So under the auspices of achieve.org, an effort was set up to develop a set of standards out of that would be consistent with this framework. So um, they set forth 60 performance expectations, abbreviated PEs a little later on, uh, by taking different cells out of this three-dimensional array of the mathematical, of the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. Uh, and then those are carefully distributed across grade levels. They're stranded with storylines across grades. They're linked in complicated ways. And they're a little overwhelming. Here's one of these um, performance expectations. This one is. Uh, combining, uh, it's for grade five, it's in Earth and Space Sciences. You've got the title at the top there, Earth and Human Activity. The standard, the statement of the standard is here, science, students who demonstrate understanding can do this, obtain and combine information um, about ways individual communities use science ideas to protect the Earth, uh, resources, environment. You know which of these dimensions are tapped for that cell. We see links or placeholders for links down here. I know this is fine print, but it's the overall picture that matters here, not so much the actual words. We have links to other uh, disciplinary core ideas, to other performance expectations, cross-grid and within. And we also have links at the bottom here to common core state standards. So the ELA literacy standards and the writing and the math standards that are involved are all uh, linked into these these science standards. So this was a heroic effort. It was, I think, well done. Um, it took a long time and went through many iterations with a lot of input. Uh, there's some question now as to exactly how to use it. Uh, part of that was the reason why there's yet another National Research Council report in 2014, this one on developing assessments for the next generation science standards. So we start with the, science, the content framework, then we have the standards document. Now we have another document that tells us how to build the tests using the standards. This is uh, innovative in that it calls out classroom assessment and puts more emphasis on formative testing in the classroom than it does on the external summative. And it also asks for opportunity to learn standards. We need to have ways of measuring the availability of qualified teachers, of laboratories, of textbooks, the things that we need to make science come alive for students, not just the tests. So it's an innovative document. I sat on this panel, so I know more about this one than the others. And uh, it's, uh, we'll, well, we'll see where it goes. There's efforts underway right now to begin drafting a science, assessment, science assessments for California. They're still quite preliminary. My understanding is that the plans were just presented to the state board at their March meeting a few days ago. Um, and. Uh, Things are still very preliminary, but I, I, I like some of the ideas that they have, and I trust the people that are involved in that effort. So I'm optimistic about science getting more of a fair shake than it's gotten for some years. A very few tests, uh, slides here on testing English learners because it's such an important population, especially in California, and we really need to, uh, you, we, it just, this presentation would be incomplete otherwise. In addition to standards for English language arts, the Common Core, and for science, we also have new English language development standards in 2012, but we're using a test that still is aligned to the old standards from 1999. So it's high time we have a new uh, English language proficiency test, hence we're moving from the CELT to the LPAC, and those acronyms are spelled out here. A few details about the CELT and the LPAC. Um, LPAC fixes several perceived problems with the CELT. Uh, it increases the number of grade spans. Um, oh, that's the next slide. It 
California used one test for two purposes. For itself, it was used for initial assessment and also annual assessment. Unlike, I think, any, I think we're the only state that did that. It was rare in any case. The new uh, LPAC will have two versions, one screener, which will not be used for accountability, and then a more extensive test that will be used for accountability and uh, check, checking the, the AMAOs, or Annual Measurable Achievement Objectives. Sorry, more acronyms. What can I say? Um, here's where we have a split out into a larger number of grade spans, uh, reduction in the number of performance levels, same domains. Provisions for moving into um, computerized testing. The LPAC will be designed in a way that it can be put online at some point in the future. It'll, initially, it will be paper pencil. And here's the implementation timeline. Pilot testing through field testing to operational administration and the years. You see that everything is in place by 2018-19. So alignment of testing and curriculum and instruction is essential. This is the theory of how this curious invention of standards is supposed to bring that alignment about. If we have curriculum and instruction and assessments both based on the same content standards, then that's supposed to give us assessments that are aligned with, test, with curriculum and instruction. What children learn and what they're tested on are both the content standards, so where's the problem? Well, here's the way it actually works. Uh, the content standards uh, our assessments are aligned with the content standards in a sense, but that's a one-way alignment. Everything on the tests can be found somewhere in the content standards, but there's a lot in the content standards that never gets tested. The content standards are broad, ambitious documents. The easiest way to get uh, consensus around the table when you're building these things is to put in what everybody wants. That gives you a very broad document. Everybody can point with pride to their ambitious standards and see how much is, brag about how much is in there. The fact that that means instruction could be a mile wide and an inch deep because that old mantra of less is more is still valid. That, that sort of gets lost in, in the process. Once we have these assessments, it's the assessments, not the standards, that drive curriculum and instruction. So uh, what gets tested gets taught. Test scores go up uh, because kids are, in fact, learning more of the stuff that's tested, but that may be because instructional time and resources are being reallocated away from other parts of the content standards which just don't happen to be in the test. So we can have an appearance of improving test scores that's not really uh, reflecting broader uh, mastery of the full range of the content standards. Dan Koritz wrote about this very uh, clearly in his book Measuring Up around 2012 maybe. I don't remember the exact year. Um, Another problem that we need to deal with with these systems, one that that last document around science that laid out the three purposes for assessment and distinguished formative classroom testing from large scale dealt with, is this problem of using the same test for multiple purposes. Uh, in particular, uh, the design constraints on large scale standardized tests for accountability purposes are very different from the design constraints on classroom level tests for, to guide teaching and learning. I'm not going to go through all the bullets on this slide, but, very, but in brief, the design criteria for the large scale tests is that they be reliable, objective, time and, and cost efficient, machine scorable. We need to be able to take the scorable record out of the school to someplace else and quickly get to a score in a way that will give us scores that have the same meaning from different times and places. We can track progress, we can compare schools. Classroom assessment, the quality is judged by the effect on instruction. There's an instructional raison d'etre and the test tasks themselves may be of instructional value. Because of all this, large scale outside tests are largely multiple choice. In the classroom, design and format can be uh, determined by instructional goals. Uh, and then you see these tests are given within a fixed testing window. These are given when, they, when it works for the individual teacher. This local context bullet, uh, bullet I'm going to say a bit more about on my next slide. Uh, delayed format for feedback, immediate feedback, and so forth. There, it's very hard because of these differences to build one test that works for both purposes. Um, that business about local context is key. Um, I've 
drawing a distinction on this slide between what I'm calling curriculum dependent test question and a curriculum neutral test question. Curriculum neutral means a question that's intended to measure something in a valid way regardless of what the, in, the kid's prior instruction has looked like. We need to know in broad outline what it looks like, say I, AKA the standards, but not in, in specifically. Um, the common core state standards in English language arts literacy say that students in high school should have read a Shakespeare play. Fine. It doesn't say which Shakespeare play. If I know that the students have read The Merchant of Venice, I can ask about Portia or Shylock and specific scenes in the play, and I can look at uh, foreshadowing and character development and so forth with very focused questions. I can ask why something happened at a given, at a given point in time. If all I know is that the students have read a play, but I don't know which one, and I want to test those same things, I'm likely to fall back on, on questions that just test their knowledge of definitions. I can't probe in the same way. In science, if I know that kids have studied the ecology of a meadow, I can ask questions about what happens if a fox comes in. And they can look at food chains and disruptions and so forth. If they've studied the ecology of a pond, I can get at the same big ideas, but with different specific questions. If I don't know which one they've studied, then I can't do either one. So, we're really limited in, in drilling deeper if we are forced to use assessments that have to be designed to work across all the different variations of curriculum that we find in a system where there is no Ministry of Education. Some alternatives, if we can't uh, refer to specific classroom examples, are hand out a separate document that kids have to read along with the test, make the items big and complicated with text heavy so that, that everything we need is, is in the item in the self-contained package, Ask the kids to write about an application they know about. You know, choose a novel you've read and discuss character development. Well, that's fine, but those things are tough to score and tough to standardize. Or we can use multiple choice items and just limit ourselves to details that actually are called out explicitly as examples in the standards, which is what happens. Um, I'm going to go through this quickly. Uh, higher order intens intentions to measure higher order thinking are tough because Test questions that get at real world problem solving, 21st century skills, have to, are, are best designed referring to complex, ambiguous, ill-structured problems where there are multiple, solution, multiple criteria for judging the quality of a solution. There's more than one right answer. There's an inherent ambiguity in the situation. That's the way life is. But when we try to build items for those things with all good intentions, the item writers tend to simplify, clarify, and in the process, make the item more objective and more legally defensible, but they change the meaning of the item. Um, if we are really looking at how kids can do with real world material, then their real world experience really matters. And kids who've had different backgrounds will do diff show different patterns of performance. This goes back to that idea of curriculum embedded versus curriculum neutral. And finally, if we design items that really do get at these complex ideas authentically and nobody can do them, they're going to be dropped from the test because an item that nobody can answer doesn't discriminate and it fails the psychometric criteria. So uh, this is uh, from a panel report. I chaired this panel on the future of NAEP. And uh, the entire report is authored by the entire committee. But I'm happy to say that this is almost a quote from a, a, a section that was written by Laurie Shepard, whose work I in, admire in, enormously and who has pushed hard on better ways of linking Curric uh, testing and uh, curriculum and instruction. These, so these, these ideas, because they're so germane to what I wanted to talk about today, despite all this text, I wanted to put the slide in. Thank you. So finally, item comparisons. I have, I'm looking here at the old California standards tests and the new Smarter Balanced Assessment uh, Consortium tests. And I just have eight or nine items I'm going to show you. And I've chosen. From the, from the California standards test, I've gone to, the, gone to the released items available on the website. And for Smarter Balanced, I'm taking pieces from the practice tests, which are on their website. So this is all public domain. Um, I'm going to first, I've chosen examples in grade three English language arts and grade seven mathematics. And for each of those two subject grade combinations, I've, got, I've chosen two objectives or pairs of objectives, really. I'm going to show you what the items look like. So let's start by looking at English language arts item formats. In, in English language arts, um, the um, 
items come in groups associated with reading passages. So this is actually a description of a passage-sized passage chunk from the, EL, from the CST and a passage-sized chunk from the Smarter Balance Test. First of all, the Smarter Balance passage is 50% longer. It comes from a labeled authentic source, meaning that something was actually written for another purpose. It wasn't just crafted as the stimulus material for a test question. In this case, the passage we're looking at comes from Highlights for Children. Um, the CST passage is followed by five multiple choice items. The Smarter Balance passage is followed by seven items, only two of which are traditional multiple choice. The other five are different formats. You'll see a couple of those formats in a moment. In addition, the Smarter Balanced test includes a performance assessment for every grade level for math and for, for English language arts. This is an excerpt from the performance task instructions for, the third, for grade three ELA. This is why I said eight or nine items. You can count this as one of my items or not. If you count it, you get nine. If you don't, you get eight. I'll, that's probably more detail than I needed to spell out here. Um, so you found two sources of, about being an astronaut. You go through these instructions. You'll notice that the atom requires skimming as well as careful reading, and that it involves the integration of multiple sources of information. These are key elements of the new, more ambitious standards. This is Im impressive for a third grader. If I go back and look at the kinds of tests that were, the kinds of expectations we had at this grade level back in the days of the old uh, MAT, uh, SAT, Gates McGinnity, those 1950s, 60s, 70s sort of uh, district level standardized tests, they were nothing like this. We really, really have ramped things up since then. So, one element that each of these two assessments was supposed to measure uh, are given by these objectives here. This is an objective from, for the CST. Uh, use sentence and word context to find the meaning of unknown words. For smarter balanced, here's a uh, corresponding expectation. Um, they're basically the same. They're pretty similar. The language is a little clearer and a little more up to date in the smarter balance assessment. I guess I'm doing that somehow. Huh? No, just happens? Okay. Random, okay. Well, here's a ran non-random item from the California Standards Test, which is measuring that objective I just showed you. I'll read the sentence from the story. What does the word skittering mean in the sentence? Running, dragging, driving, crawling. So even without the passage, and even without knowing the meaning of the word skittering, you could probably get this right. It does tap into the use of sentence level context, but the most plausible strategy for solving this item is a straightforward distractor elimination. The phrase on his quick little feet pretty much eliminates options C and D. The word quick pretty much eliminates option B, so you don't need much beyond that to get to the right answer. It's not a bad item, it's just not a very strong item to test what's to be measured. Now let's look at the smarter balanced item. I'm, I, I wanted to end on a high note, and my, my message here is that smarter balanced tests really are better. We really are moving in the right direction, despite all the limitations, despite the need for attention to the whole system and not just the, the tests themselves, despite the challenges of the formative assessment and summative assessment and everything else, we're moving in the right direction. So on this item, read a sentence from the passage, a jumble of sticks and grass stuck out from the middle of the reef. What does the word jumble most likely mean? So the first thing that catches my eyes here compared to what does the word skittering mean in the sentence on the previous item is that the item stem emphasizes the inherent ambiguity of language with the boldface words most likely. Also, this item clearly goes beyond sentence level comprehension. Um, it's, the item is straightforward given the entire passage, but you, it's much more difficult to solve using just uh, the, the sentence and certainly not just by distractor elimination. I also noticed that the CST item, if we went back and look at that, look at that, is very low level vocabulary, very high frequency words, short words, except for skittering, which sort of sticks out. Whereas in the smarter balanced item, the vocabulary is more consistent. Words like wreath, middle, jumble, there, there's more uh, complex vocabulary in, in this item. So that's part of what happens when you have authentic text. You don't get these things that are sort of constructed that slip in what you need in order to make an item work. Uh, and the result is that the passage level gestalt gestalt of the passage works much better. I won't give you references on that unless you ask me. Um, another element here that Smarter Balanced and CST are supposed to measure, um, this is the, 
old, our old friend, the main idea, beloved of English teachers and sort of scoffed at by curriculum experts in reading, but we still ask kids to find the main idea of passages. And we, so underlying theme or author's, author's message from the CST, similarly here, you'll notice that the uh, common core standard that this uh, evidence statement is based on also talks about ex explain how they support the main idea. Now that's something that's been in standards documents for a long time, but in the CSTs, that kind of and explain or discuss is honored in the breach. You never see it. Now let's look at the items that are supposed to measure the, the, this objective. Here's one from the CST. Which saying best tells what monkey learned in this story? Okay. Now this story is um, actually from a folk tale about a monkey who's in a tree. He sees a woman walking in the street below and she drops some coconut cakes. And the, and the lady says, oh boy, have I ever got trouble now? I have so much trouble. And she goes away, distressed, and the monkey comes down out of the tree and eats the cakes. And he really likes the cakes. He wants more and he thinks the cakes are called trouble. So then he goes into the market and he asks somebody for some trouble. And I won't, I won't tell you what happens. And I won't give away the exciting conclusion of the story. Uh, but the correct answer is B in any case. Be careful what you ask for. Okay. Now let's look at the smarter balanced item. Here you see the response format is more complex. Um, in addition to giving the answer, the student is then asked what detail from the story supports that answer. The associated passage in this case is a story about some birds who build a nest in a wreath that's been left on a door of a home. A little girl next door watches this. She sees the, the eggs hatch. Later on, some movers come to that house and the little girl intervenes and insists the movers should use the side door, not the front door, so that they don't disturb the, the birds. Um, this is a story from Highlights for Children that I mentioned before. So the answer is A, animals should be protected. The telling detail is you can't use this door, Jesse said, holding your arms out stiff. You can see that if I choose a different answer here, I might find a different detail down here that kind of connects to it. It's not obvious without having read the passage how you're supposed to get to the right answer here. So, so again, the item format is more complex and we're, doing, we're more faithful to the intent and we're also bringing in the supporting details. So this is moving in the right direction. Grade seven mathematics, the last couple of item pairs. Um, first, the objectives. Uh, these are similar. Once more, you'll notice the common core objective is a little more precise. This just says represent quantitative relationships graphically, interpret the meaning of a specific part of a graph under the common core item, decide whether the two quantities are in a proportional relationship, e.g. by testing for equivalent ratios at a table or graphing on the coordinate plane and observing whether the graph is a straight line through the origin. A lot more mathematics vocabulary shows up in this objective here, and it's much more definite about what we're doing. Here's the CST item, and this is typical. Um, I know this may be too small to read from the back there, so. The table below shows the charges for renting and racing a go-kart. Grand Prix go-kart, number of laps, price dollars, which graph best represents these prices. There's four options. Now, this is typical of the kinds of, the, I'll just tell you what I find infuriating, and you can see why people who look at these things closely find it infuriating. The first column in this graph says that if you run a Grand Prix go-kart and you want to go zero laps, it costs $5. <laughs> now that works tidily if what we want to do is see whether kids can go from this graph, this table, to one of these graphs, but it's silly in the context of the frame that we've put around the, the math of, for the problem. All we need to see here is this goes from five to 20, and only one of these lines goes from five to 20. This is the right answer. So it's, that's, that's what passes for measuring graphing and use of graphs to solve problems in, in, uh, in the common, in the CST days. And I feel bad about bashing the CST test. I didn't, I don't have to look very hard to find things to, to criticize. You know, these are not, I'm not cherry picking here. This is uh, one of the first items I looked at. Here's a smarter balanced item. It's not a simple multiple choice. Select all the graphs that show a proportional relationship between X and Y. And the answer is, this graph does, and this graph does. So we need to check there and a check there to get, to get credit. So it's much more clearly testing a, a well-defined piece of mathematical content, and it's doing it so without one of these sort of distorted story problem frames. 
another element both tests are supposed to measure. And this now is much closer to what was called story problems when, when I was taking mathematics, maybe when you were as well. Um, the language is pretty similar. Uh, there's more mathematical language here talking about rational numbers. Here it's fractions and decimals, percents. Um, it's using the numbers for problem solving. Here's a CST item. Tasha is buying a CD regularly $12.99 on sale for one fourth off, which expression can be used to estimate the discount. This is enough, illustrates another thing that happens with CST items. It may happen to a lesser extent with smarter balanced items, where we try to sneak in as many things as we possibly can into one item. One thing we'd like to be able to test is estimation. So this is, uses the word estimate, and it substitutes $13 for $12.99. So in a sense, it's estimation. But $13 appears in all four of these response alternatives. So if it's testing estimation, it's a really pretty weak test. Um, I suppose a student could insist on handwriting none of the above because you don't have 1299 or something. But uh, basically, you know, we're saying we're doing more than we're doing with this item. And we've, we've kind of fudged to, to cover our bases. Um, here's the item from the Common Core. I'm sorry, from the um, Smarter Balanced, which, which is from, uh, aligned with Common Core. Uh, Mark buys a wooden board that is seven and a half feet long. The cost of the wooden board is 50 cents per foot, including tax. Enter the total cost in dollars of the wooden board. So this requires working with fractions and decimals. We have seven and a half, we have 0 0.50 per foot. But the big thing that we see here is the response format. It's not multiple choice at all. You click and assemble your answer using the, the keypad, and you have these control keys and so forth. This interface is a little clunky, but it's vastly superior to anything we had with the separate Mark C, Mark Sense answer sheets for allowing kids to enter their own free response items. The old format would have been a, a grid with rows labeled 0 through 9 and columns for the characters, and you darken the circles to, to code in your number. So this is much better than that. And I was concerned that kids wouldn't be able to handle this comfortably, but it doesn't seem to have been as much of a problem as, as it might have been. So. so that's the end of the items I wanted to show you. I've, I've talked longer than I had intended, but not all that long, I guess. And there's still plenty of time for, for questions. Um, I'm closing with a quotation from almost 100 years ago from Edward Lee Thorndike, one of the grand old, old men of our, our discipline. Uh, I guess uh, after almost a century, the hard part is still the actual expert work of remedying the imperfections. It's easy to, to criticize, but a lot of well-intentioned people, bright people, are doing the best they can with the best technology they have, and we're making progress. So I'm, I'm hoping to, that you'll agree that we're ending on a high note here. I'm optimistic about where California is going. Thank you. I'd be happy to entertain your questions. I was about to say that one of my, our colleagues at Stanford for a long time was Mary Bud Rowward, who did her work on teacher wait time and found that <laughs> the teachers are willing just to sit with the awkward silence to get more high, high level questions. So you, I, I'm, I'm, I will, you will not outlast me on that. So. <laughs> Go ahead, Megan. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done in a lot of different arenas. Uh, everything from the nuts and bolts of better pre-service and in-service teacher preparation, so the teachers make, are able to do assessment better, um, to better, uh, I think there's need, for, uh, there's space for research around teachers' use of the new digital portal that came with Smarter Balanced, part of the overall Smarter Balanced system in addition to the summative test and the, and the interim tests, is this uh, framework for teacher resources. The te the, the things are vetted. They're tagged according to subject area or uh, objective and, and level and what populations they work for. And the ideal, the hope is that there'll be a learning 
sort of a digital learning community of teachers who will uh, work with these materials. I think that would be a tremendously exciting area to work in. It calls for a very different set of skills than most psychometricians are trained with. Uh, you mentioned in your very kind and direct, uh, opening remarks by talking about uh, that, that Lynn address, my, one of my takeaways there was that we need people from lots of different disciplines, academic, subject, social science disciplines, looking at testing problems. We need to see what anth how do anthropologists see the phenomenon of testing, how do linguists see the phenomenon of testing, and so forth. And, and this is a, a space for that. Uh, going back to a more technical quantitative uh, end of things, I see uh, a need for assessment models that allow us to make better use of classroom data. And one way to do that might be through something like Bob Mislevy's uh, evidence-centered design framework uh, or other frames like Mark Wilson's system for, uh, that, that make use of Bayes networks, Bayes nets or some other way of aggregating information so that we have a set of priors on a student and we sort of dock some new information with those priors and update them to keep track of where people are going where different kids may be taking different assessments at different times, the model has to be dynamic. We're mostly using psychometric models that treat what we're trying to measure as fixed. But uh, achievement by nature changes through time. If we didn't believe that kids learned more and that their level of achievement changed, you know, we'd be in a different business. Uh, so we need models that, that, are, uh, uh, that take account of how much we expect kids to grow over time and, and give teachers much better real-time feedback that they can use to, to guide individual learners' instruction. Some of that may, we, involves using, making better use of uh, online platforms, but I, I really think it's um, misguided to look for ways to try to get the teacher out of the equation. I don't think that, that, that that's going to be the solution, but there's a lot of really exciting work to be done. Um, we also need better ways of aggregating this information from classroom level assessments to use for not necessarily accountability, but at least for learning about the system at a macro level. Um, we use, uh, there's an uh, active debate uh, among in technical meetings that I go to over whether or not we need to maintain a bright line between tests that are used for formative classroom pur purposes versus those that are used for accountability. Some people see a bright new future in siphoning off data from the routine tests that, and, and exercises and activities children are doing already that we can use to inform uh, their overall progress. Others say if you do that, you're necessarily going to distort the instructional process and people are going to be working to the test all the time. We have to give kids the space to work in, 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 at times and in contexts where they know they're not evaluated. That brings it, it's a philosophical question as well as a psychometric question. Uh, testing is a very strange business. We, the tester purports to be able to wrest information from the examinee that the examinee might not be willing to divulge. We're forcing someone to, to show us what they can do. We're forcing someone to, to give us information they might not otherwise disclose. And there's a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, testing is also artificial in the sense that it's a performance. When somebody's answering a question on a test, they're not performing the test task for any authentic purpose. Uh, years ago, one of the earlier, the preceding NAEP frameworks in reading had a strand called reading for literary experience. They all thought that was comical. How do you ask children taking a test to read for literary experience? They're taking a test. Uh, who are we fooling? But uh, so there's, there's questions around that. But I think that ways of looking at classroom assessment and how assessment can better support classroom learning is, is a uh, an area that really needs work. Rick Stiggins said decades ago that 90% uh, that of the testing that matters is classroom testing and way, way more than 90% of the research on testing is the external standardized stuff. So we need to, and it's understandable. The classroom testing is not standardized, it's messy, it's low quality, it's, you know, it's, it's hard work to get, get the data. Uh, and when you get it, it's, 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 you can't fit your models. So who wants to do that? It's, you know. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of very good work in educational research, and I would like to, to know what you think about whether or not that research translates into policy implement, 
implementation. And if that is not the case, what could be done to streamline that process? It's a great, great question. Um, <clears throat> There was a National Research Council report, I think in 2012, from a panel that was looking at the question of, of around, questions around the uptake of scientific findings in policy. And some of the findings were predictable. Uh, the old uh, sort of Pasteur's quadrant model, Stokes model that we have applied research and basic research and the best research is you know, basic research on applied problems in, in Pasteur's quadrant. Uh, is, is a nice model, but it doesn't really fit, fit the reality. Um, it, it's more complicated than that. Policymakers have ob agendas already. They appropriate whatever information they have to fit that, to make the case that they already want to make. So that, that's a challenge. But there are, in fact, ways that, that, that scientific findings can, can help. Uh, I mentioned, I'm not sure whether I said it in my talk, it was in my notes, that. Uh, one of the, I think it may have been a bullet on the slide, that no, the No Child Left Behind fancy scheme was, had no research base. Nobody had ever empirically looked to see whether this was going to have, have the effects that, that were anticipated. We, they just made it up. Uh, when California uh, embarked on the API under the PSAA of 1999, around 2000, 2001, we did the research and did models and simulations to find out uh, what the likely effects would be, and we managed to craft a system that su succeeded in allocating rewards in a rational way across low-performing and high-performing schools. That was the days of the governor's uh, awards for top-performing schools. That's a terrible idea. Uh, ask any psychometrician about the idea of giving a test to everybody, then looking for the extreme outliers and showing shining extreme public attention on them with, with very you know, flashy monetary awards. You know, you're going to find things you didn't want to see. <laughs> and and it, it's, it, that's another story. Uh, I, there's room for progress if we do it quietly. Once something becomes politicized, it becomes much harder. Um, a good discussion of that question is found in, um, uh, what's his name? The book Spin Cycle. Um, Jeff Henning, uh, where he looks at the dust up around charter schools and concludes that we actually know a fair amount about what does and doesn't work in charter schools. And there's actually much more agreement between researchers in different camps once you get behind the facade of all of the rhetoric and the public positions. Uh, but once the thing becomes a political football, then it becomes impossible to make progress. So I'm optimistic. I think that we. There is, there is plenty of space to do good work and actually ha see the uptake. Uh, one promising bit of progress in ESSA is a revision in the definition of scientifically based. So the definition of scientifically based research in NCLB was very narrow, really followed Ru uh, Russ Whitehurst's line on randomized controlled trials. And the new definition is still not where we'd like to see it, but there's space for qualitative work now it's recognized for evaluations. There are places where we really can use a broader range of research methods to inform uh, practice. And that, that's an example of progress that's coming from pushback from researchers on, on, the, on the federal process. So there's, there's hope. So. Uh, Harold. Um, do you have, uh, oh, we talked earlier about um, accountability systems predisposed to look for single scores to judge a student's you know, achievement or school success. With the governor's budget and the LCFF and the LCAP, right there are eight priority areas which you yes. talked about mm -hmm. in the state. And all those presumably are going to be evaluated. And mm -hmm. how they're going to do that is unclear yes. in many cases. Mm -hmm. and how much of it is going to be controlled by the state is unclear or monitored by the state or done in a more local fashion yes. with some mm -hmm. sort of reporting up. I guess um, I have two questions. What do you, you know, if you look in your crystal ball, uh, how realistic is this? And, and in what way can that information, like through dashboards, right, which are mm -hmm. commonly used now, be fed back to the public and policymakers? And then I guess the broader question is what's the role of psychometricians in all of that? Oh, great. Those are, thank you. I, I couldn't have asked for a, a, a more inviting question to, to ruminate on. Uh, I think that we're, 
we need to clarify, and, and it, it, it's an ongoing process, and there's conversations now about which pieces of the eight priorities are going to be standardized across the states and sort of part of the state level system and which parts will be left to the locals. And um, there, I think there will be some pieces that will necessarily be, uh, be standardized. Everything using the smarter balance scores ought to be uniform across states. That will allow for some comparisons. I think the hope is to leave as much to the locals as possible. A uh, challenge is, as you suggest with your question, is how to avoid this data push phenomenon where we think that somehow just giving people data is going to solve problems and they may not know what to do with it. So uh, the, the eight priorities do include teacher qualifications. They include things that we can, that are very clearly measures of process. And if you, I think if people work directly to improve students' access to high quality course sequences, that per se is a good thing. You know, that's a case where focusing on the indicator itself will in fact have a salutary effect, unlike simply focusing on getting test scores to go up with some tests, which may have, a, 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 a le have, have mixed effects at best. So um, I think we're, I don't know how it's going to play out, but um, it, it's the right question. Uh, I don't like the term dashboard, but um, if you're trying to drive and you're watching your dashboard, you're going to drive into a tree or something. <laughs> but but that, that's the language we have to, to work with. So. So, please. so you ended this talk with an optimistic comparison between where we were and then using the power spectrometrics where we can go. Mm -hmm. um, but stepping out of those particular parts of the Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're using the kind of the general measures that you listed here, um, which seem very raw to me or very blunt. So I'm curious, are there other kinds of measures that are drawing on psychometric theory that should be used or should be adopted um, that are more fine-grained? Uh, the place for the fine-grained measures, I think, is the formative classroom assessment. Um, the annual summative testing is always going to be measuring a very broad domain. Therefore, it's necessarily going to be a thin sampling. It's not going to be linked in close tightly to the immediately antecedent instruction. So it's not going to be useful for instructional decision making. Um, you mentioned the, uh, this other, this range of other kinds of measures. There I worry about the purpose for which measures are being used and the stakes and the context in which they're being used. It's easy to measure classroom climate, you know, even if it's like the MET project did using Ferguson's measures, the tripod measure or something like that, uh, provided the stakes aren't high. But once you attach stakes to these things, the data just becomes very easy to manipulate. Even something like Duckworth's grit, which is really just a new name for perseverance. It's, it's something we've known about for a long time. But you know, it, it's fine as long as it's not uh, if you're rewarding people for getting a certain score profile, it's not that hard to figure out how to do it. So th that's where the challenges come in. <clears throat> There's been a project for many years at Educational Testing Service uh, called the New Constructs Project under Pat Killinan's direction. Uh, Dr. Killinan is a former student of Dick Snow's at Stanford from years ago. And he, that project is looking specifically at how to measure these sort of so-called non-cognitive outcomes, the 21st century skills, the higher order thinking, also motivation, uh, persistence, uh, and, and, and um, the, there are actually some fairly clever ways to do this. They're not ready for prime time just yet. I think we, we're going to see some better measures rolled out, rolling out at some point. But I, I think that the solution may have to be that we look for ways of using these measures to inform process in ways that don't frighten people into manipulating the process to get the good scores. That's, that, so the challenge isn't narrowly psychometric. It has to do with the context in which measures are used and the motivations people have to answer in good faith so that we can actually get information to help. 
as opposed to simply trying to duck the, you know, the consequences by, by faking the best possible response. It, it's a tough sell. Uh, Nicole? Yeah. Of, um, uh, achievement and, and, and actually access to opportunity. And I'm wondering if you feel that, you know, sort of California is swinging way back, or I don't even know if it's a pendulum swing so much, it's just a focus on at the local now. If, with the extent to which you feel like what the promise or potential pitfalls might be in that for sort of reducing persistent inequality across our schools? Uh, one of the. Um, one of the things that NCLB got right, I think, was the requirement that scores be desegregated. I haven't, I've heard very few people say that was a bad idea. It poses psychometric challenges because splinter, small groups are necessarily less reliably measured than bigger groups are. But setting that aside, um, that's something that was retained in, in ESSA. And I think we'd have a very hard time going back to a day when we didn't show people how individual subgroups within schools were doing. Uh, civil rights groups were also opposed to performance testing back at the beginning of the 90s. And, uh, proponents were saying sort of naively, well, if we just give kids a chance to show us what they really can do with real world tasks, then we'll get away from those bad old biased multiple choice tests. It didn't work that way because the performance tasks required lots of writing. The scorable record was something that required kids to do, use much more high level literacy and, show, and much more motivation to do all that writing. And the gaps were, if the gaps were smaller, it was only because the tests were less reliable. We, it didn't, we didn't get what we wanted. A lot of it has to do with how things are, are sold and explained, and that we need to listen respectfully and approach these things with great care. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's a matter of building trust. I don't know how it's going to play out. We, with looking back at what happened with class, that class was torpedoed not by advocates for uh, underserved populations. It was torpedoed by people who were concerned about uh, the state's incursion into curriculum. It's the, the people who say, just teach my kids what they need to know, but don't mess with their heads. Uh, and that's, um, so it was a different, different constituency that wasn't listened to thoughtfully and respectfully at that time. And also the fact that advocates for new curriculum were trying to use assessment to smuggle in a different kind of curriculum and it, it backfired. So, you know, I don't know. I'm, that crystal ball is, is still pretty fuzzy. We're at 7 o'clock. So, Harold, you said you were going to... Oh, of course. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um... I'm Harold Levine, I'm Dean of the School of Education, and uh, I certainly want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I want to thank Dr. Hartle for coming. Uh, I think we've all enjoyed the talk. I certainly have. I, um, I'm really, um, one of the things that most fascinated me was your recounting sort of the history of testing in California in recent years, at least. Um, and it, it reminds me that the three things that you talked about, really, is the, comp is the three Ps. The politics, philosophy of teaching and learning, mm -hmm. and our theories of learning, and psychometrics. Yes. And it's fascinating to me listening to you talk, because you've lived it and you've been such a part of this history nationally in California, but how complex and intertwined these things are. You know, politics often defines whether a state's going to be part of SBAC, right, and what kind of accountability mm -hmm. system is going to be acceptable. But as our theories of teaching and learning evolve, then the testing has to re reflect that, and the psychometric work has to reflect that. So it's not a, you know, you'd like to think that our best knowledge and theories about student learning drives standards, drives testing, and the mm -hmm. politics follows in behind, and the psychometric <laughs> is there to support it. I think mm -hmm. probably history indicates it's much more complex than that, and it's a fascinating history. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate your length some of it out for us tonight. Thank you. Um, we have a, uh, you gave us a gift. We have a small gift for you. Uh, UC Davis produces olive oil. And uh, we have a bottle of our finest vintage oh. olive oil. Uh, 
Thank you very much. You don't have to get on the plane, so you can no, no. put your suitcase. Uh, this Delightful. is a case of the, you know, the university making lemonade out of lemons. So we have all these old, you know, olive trees, and mm -hmm. they were messy and got in the way, and somebody decided to make olive oil. Perfect. So, but thank you so thank much, you. and thank you all.